talk we're going to hear from a real, both an optimist and a visionary, um, who has been responsible for an enormous amount of the progress that's gone on in regenerative medicine over the past decade or more, um, has worked very um, strongly in pioneering companies that have looked into a number of the areas really fundamental to the first time of aging, uh, including Geron, I'm sure you know, and also Advanced Cell Technology, now a new company, Biotime, and I expect that we'll hear something about that right now. Michael Weiss. Thank you very much. It's a, a pleasure of mine to be here. Uh, I didn't realize how beautiful this campus is. It's really very nice. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And uh, I want to circle back uh, to the first talk Dr. Hazekin gave. I don't know about you guys. I, I noticed there was rapt attention in what he said. Uh, certainly has attracted me. Uh, I, I'm a, uh, a you know, cellular gerontologist and my interest in my career is to, to not only understand the, the biology of aging, and, but how can we learn something to improve the human condition, maybe even extend human longevity. And uh, so I'm going to talk today about the cells Dr. Hazeltine was talking about, uh, these immortal cells. Uh, he talked about life and death and the human life cycle. I, I remember growing up watching uh, uh, Ben Casey. I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember that show. Yeah, a couple of minutes. But you remember the beginning, man, woman, birth, death, infinity. And I used to look at that saying, that sounds profound. And I, ever since then, I've been entranced by the immortality of the species and how it's accomplished. You know, a simple way of putting it, that maybe we just think of with all of us. We're made of cells, of course, trillions of them, that have been proliferating backward in time all the way through hundreds of millions of years to the beginning of life on the planet, with leaving no dead ancestors in their wake, ever, or we wouldn't be here. Think if you think about it. It's the progeny, it's our somatic cells that are destined to die. And so all the cells in our body are, have this immortal legacy going backward in time, millions of years, and will face death the first time ever in our lifetime. Why is that? And more importantly, what can we learn about the immortality of the species to transport those uh, observations and discoveries of modern technologies into something that will really do something about human aging? And that's what I'm going to talk about today. And the, 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 the translation of some of these new discoveries into what we think are some paths that could actually lead to some of these therapies and hopefully in our lifetime. So, the backdrop, we, uh, uh, Aubrey mentioned, you know, I'm an optimist, I guess maybe I am because I'm showing you a rising sun here. Actually, it's, these are cells derived from these immortal cells, the embryonic stem cells, uh, that Dr. Uh, Martin Perry here in uh, the LA area took a picture of some years ago. There's a backdrop, though, to talk about the properties. You've probably all heard in the debate about embryonic stem cells, because they're from the root of human life, they can make everything in the human body. And that's a first, ever. Medicine has never had a platform, a mechanism to make and replace all of the cells of the human body as odd as it sounds, and we can replace your carburetor and your tires in your car, but the leading cause of death in the United States is the heart cell, the loss of heart cells in your heart. Well, that doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? We can keep a, you know, an antique car around forever, but we can't keep the human body around, even dramatically toward forever. Well, these are that first platform. They make every kind of cell. Because of their being an immortal cell, uh, they open the door to merging them with DNA technology. Uh, it's, it's, it's a merger of two technologies, genetic, molecular genetics or genomics that we've talked about in cell biology can now be married together with these cells. We see it in where these cells have been used to make mice. You know, they turn them, the mouse version of these into mice. And we can go in and just do all kinds of sophisticated changes to the DNA, to the blueprint and then, you know, make them. Uh, there are human therapeutic applications, which California is funding, and of course, the, a lot of research that can be done with these cells as well. 
one of the most significant things, I guess, as a gerontologist is, as I said, we believe here for the first time we've really captured these immortal cells. These really are those cells that are transported from generation to generation. We've caught them and sort of kept them in, from going that immortal cycle, but they're showing this immortality. As an example, I can take two real quick, how we know these are these immortal cells. Uh, all the cells grown in the laboratory dish from the human body age. This has been used for years to study the biology of aging, in fact. We predicted, based on all this biology, that these cells would be the only exception of a normal human cell that would proliferate forever, like Energizer Bunny. And sure enough, they did. And that's at least, so these are called the immortal cells, and these are the first human cells ever cultured that have this property of replicating without limit. So, now I want to switch from all this optimistic stuff to the realities. Because, you know, there's, as Dr. Haskin said, gee, you know, you can imagine now some pretty dramatic interventions. If these are really the cells that keep making us, and we can take a cell from you or me and transport it back in time and make these cells, uh, lots of opportunity. We don't need to belabor that and talk about it. That's, that's the optimistic side. Let's delve immediately into the challenges. And that's where I want to spend the rest of my night talking about. I talk about it because I'm excited. I think that we know how to deal with the challenges, and I want to walk you through that quickly, because I find it very encouraging. Well, the, to balance the uh, rosy sun, I'm showing the stark cold reality of the moon, cold moon, uh, is to lay out the challenges. The big, the number one, and this is really a problem. These cells, because they're so powerful, they turn into everything in the human body. That's thousands of different kinds of cells. That's a problem. Uh, it's few of us, you know, who study anatomy and histology and cell biology really can remember all the cells in the human body. And, and you know, it's my second thing there, no precise markers. Different kinds of cells decorate themselves with proteins on their surface that tell you, is that a liver cell, is that a heart cell, and so on. You know what? We don't even know what those are in the early developing human. Because President, not just President Bush, but previous administrations have banned much of federal funding for early embryo research, we really don't know very much about these cells. If we, if we had these wonderful cells that could cure diabetes, we don't even know what properties they would have. And so. Enormous complexity, a very poor understanding of these markers. Uh, and then we need to actually manufacture product, don't we? We need to scale it up. And, uh, and we need to have them pure. And you may have noticed some of the early companies uh, that approached the FDA saying, we want to start human already, within 10 years, clinical trials with these cells. The FDA says, oh, well, are they pure enough? So these are some of the challenges. And the way we looked at this as saying, look, here's a very complex tree. The actual, so these cells would be at the base of the tree, branching out into all the cells that make you and me. The tree, imagine this suddenly getting about at least a hundred times more complex. That's closer to the reality of you and me. So when you looked at all this and you thought, how do we make a beta cell? How do we make a heart cell? There's two different ways you can do it. One would be, maybe the first time you think it, I want that apple up there to be to make a stick and a catcher's mitt and go up and get it, so to speak. So there are early technologies to do, make things where let's go make a beta cell and figure out how this, these early cells become beta cells. What happened though is some of us were thinking about this again, we thought, look, we really want to do a lot of this in our lifetime and make a lot of this happen. Let's put a tarp under the tree and shake it and take everything that falls out. That is the way the sequencing of the genome was suddenly accelerated. That's the way this field was accelerated. So all of this complexity that leads to, you know, all the different zebra stripes, we actually have them, invisible stripes on our body, all this complexity in the human body. We invented a technology to shotgun clone, as they call it, to shake the tree. All of these cells 
that make up you and me, out of these embryonic stem cells, in a purified form, without knowing how to do it, or without knowing how a heart cell forms, or how a beta cell forms. And what we use, and it looks, it looks a little complicated, this is the tart we put into the tree. We use a combinatorial matrix approach where we try a bunch of random different conditions and a different random ways of growing the cells, and then we look for cells that could grow up from a single cell. We call that clonal derivation or shotgun cloning. And only in the last I don't know, what, five years, ten years, could all of this be done with an immense increase in computing power and a lot of other new techniques that scientists have available. We were to take all of these cells and then get the expression, the, the, the genes that are turned on and off for all the cells and then let computers run, you know, 24 hours a day for weeks and reassemble the tree for us. And it's hard to see, but up at the top is a tree, a branching tree, and these red spots on this are generated by a computer showing, you know, genes that are very highly expressed. And you can see the enormous diversity of cell types we've made this way. So basically, shaking the tree and suddenly falling out of this are over 140 early lineages that make up you and me. Um, and what we suddenly realized is the complexity problem. Wow, we thought this would be what we would be 30 years from now. Now we suddenly have all these early precursors, the muscle and you know, teeth and the inner ear and all these sorts of things. And how do we, and now we have the computers giving us all these charts of markers, these things we so desperately needed to tell one cell type from another and to figure out how to implement all this. The complexity of the what suddenly this, you know, we, we went under a stream trying to collect a glass of water and then suddenly Niagara Falls. Suddenly there's this enormous flood of information and, and cell types. Cell types like this, by the way, this up in the upper left is a propagating, purified culture of precursors to the brain. It can incorporate and regenerate, you know, the, the telencephalon of the brain. Really amazing cells. And because, it's kind of hard to see, but up at the top panel, uh, there, you can see some of these cells kind of lit up. They're pure, they're 100% pure because they were clonally isolated. We suddenly solved this problem of separating the cells out. And, you know, the fun part is the, all the cells in our body have a zip code built into them. They tell, it tells the cells where they are. These are called the homeobox genes, and when you look at these cells in the developing mouse, you can see in the lower left there, you can they identify they're in the developing jar or whatever. Well, these cell lines on the right, you can see these little histograms, we, we get these very clear zip codes. We can even tell where they were or would have been in a developing human. Well, all of this data, all of these cell lines, all of the history of research scientists have done on the development of the mouse, leading to information like a showing up here where genes are expressed in the mouse is an enormous opportunity, but again, way too complicated. How do we deal with it? And that introduces me to this subject. Uh, the DNA was a very complicated problem, billions of letters. How do we make sense of this? This led to this field called genomics, which was the study of all the regulatory and coding sequences of the DNA, and how do we make sense of all this? Well, there's a new field emerging now called embryomics, which is the study of all of these cell lineages that make up the developing human and their markers and their properties. It's just that, like genomics, it's so complicated. How do we do this? And so what we uh, launched is an international, we call it International uh, Embryo Initiative, where we opened up on the internet, any of you can go on, it's called embryome.com. And uh, it's a database open sourced so the whole world scientists can join in, sort of like Wikipedia, and help us build out this tree and all of its complexity. So here you're looking at the front page, you click on these, the simplified tree, and it takes you then to a far more detailed analysis of gene expression and reminders of the developmental anatomy and a very precise nomenclature of every cell 
and its markers and its properties and you know identification systems for them so this has all happened in the last year a lot of the critics have said well you know embryos themselves still haven't cured disease but what I want to tell you is we had to invent all new you know technologies of course the cells themselves are not even 10 years old but uh, we're excited about how all this is building out and after all to go back to the beginning of this story uh, that Dr. Hasley told us these are these immortal germline cells they keep making new people and um, we, we know that by studying the clock of aging the telomere uh, these cells start at, you know, the clock of aging is wound at the very beginning of life, and they have, you can see these growth curves, they have very long lifespans compared to normal cells. How could these cells be used in the next 10 years? You know, there's numerous examples I could give you, but one helpful one, uh, macular degeneration, so the leading cause of blindness, it's the aging of our retina. Uh, and there's, uh, these cells have now been made in uh, a form that's, appropriate to begin human clinical trials. You can see pictures of the cells in the lower right. When they become lost, they're dysfunctional in the back of the retina, they cause this cascade of pathology that cause blindness. It's a leading cause of blindness in the elderly. And the eye is a good place to start, I think. It's one, at least one of the top targets of how we hope these cells will eventually be uh, used in medicine. So, to summarize, you know, this uh, Projects really captured the attention of the world. You know, I would argue that uh, President Bush's opposition or restrictions, at least on the cell, on these cells, really angered a lot of people because this was medicine and this shouldn't be politics. And um, it caused, of course, the voters of California to fund, to vote, to, vote, to uh, fund the work themselves. Similarly, I think the whole scientific community is uh, engaged by, by this new technology and this new initiative that will allow all of the world's researchers to get together to try to delve into the complexity and then the opportunity, the commensurate opportunity these cells give us. These are actually, as a, my second bullet point here shows, the ultimate young cell, uh, actually an immortal cell, and then able to make young cells of any kind. The implications, I think, are obvious in medicine. Um, my third bullet point is the early embryonic, these early embryonic cells have a, a, an impressive plasticity, meaning they're used to building the human body, so they're very good at regenerating the human body. It's an over, maybe it's an overgeneralization, but it's a, uh, a relevant and I think appropriate generalization to make. Um, with the new technologies we can have now finally a, a very pure product that they that will be uh, safe to use in humans and ultimately uh, with these new technologies all put together the impressive thing is we now have the ability to in my opinion to take control of the human life cycle Woody Allen once said commenting on the immortality of the German life, he said some people would prefer would like to have immortality through the children I would prefer to have immortality by not dying. And that's really what we think, at least, we have here. We've captured the central mechanisms of the immortality of the human species, and we can now manipulate it. And uh, at minimum, we hope that we'll be able to make some inroads in how we, uh, how, and how we age. Thank you very much.